Um, we did have an executive session at 6.30. We are ready to start the regular meeting. I would ask you to please all stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And the exits are behind the audience and also behind us. Thank you. First order of business would be recognition of visitors. If anyone has um, any comments they'd wish to share with, with the board and the public, may address the board at times indicated on the agenda with the first opportunity being early in the meeting and the second opportunity later in the meeting. Each person is asked to speak into the microphone and identify him or herself. Speakers are asked to limit comments to three minutes, but the public comment period will have a 30-minute total time allocation. We would ask that if the 30-minute mark is being reached, then comments be held until the final comment period later in the meeting. Please remember there's no cross-discussing between persons or the board, and each speaker may speak once during each comment period. Please remember that personal attacks of any kind have no place in our community, district, or meetings and only serve to create conflict and tear us apart at the exact moment when we should be coming together. Anything of this nature directed towards staff, students, or community is unacceptable. Thank you. Anyone wishing to speak, the microphone is at that end. And Linda, is there one by you or no? Yes. There is. So at either end, anyone wishing to speak at this time? Okay, thank you. And there will be another opportunity later on in the meeting. Um, moving on to our next item of business is reports and committee updates. Um, Margaret, we'll start with you and we'll just go around the table. How's that? Okay. I can remember. <clears throat> um, so the Orange County School Boards Association had a meeting on the 2nd. Uh, a couple of things were discussed. An attorney's firm came in and kind of gave an overview of... Uh, negotiations and contract issues and the like, all stuff that we've heard from Jeff, there was nothing new. Um, and there was also discussion of the Odyssey of the Mind competition that happened at BOCES on the 5th. Uh, and I, I, I was actually there, I was one of the judges. An amazing, amazing program. Um, when I was a kid in middle school, I did the program. And then I coached a team in Cornwall back in the early 2000s. And I, I kind of say, this is the trifecta now, because I got to be a judge. Um, phenomenal program. I can't speak highly, more, any, high, any higher about it. Uh, something that, it's just, it gets kids to work together in teams, to think out of the box. Um, they have to be really creative, and it's totally student-driven. So there is an adult who is the coach, but it has to be all done by the children. So it's, it's just, you know, a lot of times you have an adult who's like, let's do it this way. No, that's, that's against the rules. Um, phenomenal program. There are some schools that are just known. You know, I, I, I was on a judging team and everybody was from Pine Bush and they talked about, my God, they, they you know, raffled off their children back in the day because they were so into this, this application or this uh, program. Um, but it was great. It was so much fun to see the kids working together and their creativity and the fact that, you know, they still had COVID restrictions most of the time. Phenomenal program. Uh, it does take a lot of work to run a team. Um, I'm, I'm toying with coming out of retirement and uh, 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 volunteering to, to run a team again because it was a great thing. But that's, that was it. <laughs> oh, and visitation. I have nothing yet. I'm working on it. Thank you, Margaret. But I want to include buildings and grounds when we do visitation at some point because they have some very important and interesting information. Um, and it's good to hear from them, too, and, and again, part of the team. So we'll add that as well. Thank you very much. John, anything? Thanks, Nancy. Just an update. Um, we're going to be meeting probably before the end of April uh, with the um, internal auditor that we just hired uh, to go over the, uh, the audit plan for this year and then uh, move on from there. But uh, more information later on the specific date Thank as we you. get closer. Thanks. Teresa? Uh, the policy committee um, via Zoom, a uh, posted it's Zoom. Oh. It's on. It's on. <laughs> it is on. <laughs> Hey, I looked first. Okay. I'm glad I all passed muster here. Thank you. God. Okay. Um, we had a snow day on the 9th, which was our planned meeting. So uh, we did post it, and it was via Zoom so that we could get this done. Um, we have um, tonight we'll be presenting 
several that will not require a second vote. They're, they're basically, there's no changes to them and they're, they're fine. And then there are others that we'll announce tonight that will be brought back again for uh, a second reading and then we'll vote on it that night. So that's it. Brendan? So the uh, Communication Committee met on February 16th. Um, we discussed a, a bunch of things. Uh, our <coughs> public forums were a big topic of conversation. Uh, to that note, we preliminarily, uh, it's a word now, yeah, it is. scheduled the first one for April 6th, which is the first Wednesday in April. Um, they're going to be a little bit different than the uh, the forums that we had back in um, in the fall, where that was really just like, rolling out the, the ball and letting the crowd play, more or less. Um, now we're going to have a little bit more to present. So uh, we're working on, uh, to that end uh, and beyond, we're working on uh, a video series right now to actually show the projects that are uh, going to be uh, improved. And I think that uh, and we've been meeting with myself, um, Oscar Rivas, who's our uh, videographer, been meeting with Walter Moran. To, uh, to discuss this, and we're off, I think, to a great start. Uh, Walter has been, to say accommodating is, uh, it, it is underselling it. He's very much bought into this whole process, and I think he's going to be a great ambassador for a lot of elements of the project moving forward. So um, that stuff is being produced right now. Um, we'll have those uh, video assets ready to be shared to the public end of March and then throughout April. We're also going to use them at the events themselves to really show people um, what these things look like, so it's not just you know a chart on a piece of paper. And then we'll also have I've been um, having communication, including meetings with uh, Holly Brooker, who is our OC's um, um, PR specialist, I guess. Uh, uh, she's creating the uh, the written assets, so pamphlets, brochures, signage, postcards, things like that. So all of these efforts are are moving in tandem, and um, I think you should start seeing, the, the public can start to expect to see the, um, the this communication really flooding out at the beginning of April. So that's it for now. Thank you, Brendan. Larry? Okay. Thank you all very much for all of your work and the work to come. Um, next item of business is the consent agenda. Use of the consent agenda permits the Board of Education to make more effective use of its time by adopting a single motion to cover those relatively routine manners. Is there anyone on the board that wishes to pull an item out? Okay. Um, it is recommended that the Board of Education approve the following consent agenda as submitted by the Superintendent of Schools, items two through nine. Do I have a motion? So moved. And a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carried. Thank you. Okay, item E, new business non-consent agenda. First reading and adoption of various Board of Ed policies. Um, item number one, resolved upon the recommendation of the Superintendent of Schools, the Board of Ed does hereby accept the first reading of the following Board of Ed policies. I will take item one as per document. Do I have a motion? So moved. And a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions, motion carried, thank you. And we move on to items two through six. There's a first reading of board policy 1500, 2160, 2210, 9500, and 9700. I would like to take those as per document. Resolved upon the recommendation of the superintendent of schools, the board of ed does hereby accept the first reading of the board of ed policies items two through six. Do I have a motion? So moved. And a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Oh, did, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, bef could the policy committee, before we fully approve these next week, just give us the, here are the changes? What was the old, what was the new? There were very small changes. Very small. I mean, I don't think we need to go through it right now, but just, you know, before we do the second reading. There were minor changes. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's, yeah. Five that had changes. That's all. Just for the 28th, we can have that then. Okay, thank you. 
Okay, well, we'll just start again. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Okay, motion carried, thank you. Okay, so item F, presentation, discussion, and board actions. Discussion on one proposition versus two propositions. Terry, do you want to? Uh, so I just want to make sure that uh, Harvey and I provide uh, some context. Uh, so this is important to vote on uh, tonight based on deadlines that we have to meet for um, uh, notification, filing deadlines, and, and the like. So what we're really looking at is one proposition would take the uh, five buildings plus the multi-sport athletics facility as one proposition. You can see on the sheet in front of you that uh, the total amount, what each costs, all is one vote. The uh, uh, two proposition would split out the work being done, infrastructure work at the five buildings as proposition one. Proposition two would be the multi-sports athletics uh, facility as, as proposition two. Uh, only way that uh, proposition two could pass is if one passed with proposition one. So you couldn't have a vote yes for proposition two and a no for proposition one. It, it doesn't, um, that's not the way we would write it. So um, splitting out into two, one must pass for two to also pass, okay? If you remember the multiple choice, A, one but not two, two but not three, um, that's, that's what we're, we're doing here. Uh, one other uh, important piece of information just for the board's consideration before discussion is um, we asked the question back uh, some of the earlier days in the facilities committee, uh, Larry, uh, everyone on my right and left um, was uh, part of that conversation. It was asked of Harvey, what happens if uh, we had two propositions and the second proposition did not pass? Uh, so if we had a two proposition, there's eight and some change million uh, on the table. Uh, we would still have access to that funding. Uh, so what we would uh, recommend is to go right back out uh, to vote. Um, our opinion, um, this is my team's opinion, that the board can have further discussion on this, is that a no vote, uh, if we were to go to two, would be our community saying no to athletics right now. Um, not location, but no, we think we have a whole lot more that we could do via infrastructure. So if we went back out to vote in the fall, our team's recommendation would be to go back to what the uh, facilities committee did, that really hard work at what all the needs were. There's more than eight million still left to be done, um, which isn't shocking news to anyone in this room or listening. Uh, so we would put it, uh, another vote up uh, going towards more infrastructure. There's more work to be done at CES, middle school, Willow, Cornwall and Hudson, and our high school. Um, so that's our team's kind of perspective on listening all these many months, uh, the board was really clear in a, in a um, unanimous vote that the location of the multi-sports facility would be the high school. Um, so that debate is over, in, in my opinion. Um, so our feeling is that should we split it out into two, and two um, went down, we would have to go back and look at our five-year plan and the needs of the infrastructure needs of the five buildings and put it uh, towards that. So. Again, one prop, everything all together, two propositions, you split out the multi-sports uh, facility. Um, two can only pass if one passes, okay? And Har can I just ask for a clarification for myself here? Um, we're discussing this now and then further on we're voting? Correct. Okay, thank you. Because there's a lot, there's a lot here. I know. Okay, so um, open for discussion. With the board here, one vote versus two, would you like to just go around the table and, Margaret, you wanna start? Love to start. Thank you. Um, yeah, you know, I was, I, I had talked to a number of people uh, in town and I, I kind of got 50-50, you know, some people saying, why are the athletic fields even being talked about now? And these are from 
people I didn't expect that conversation to happen with, big, big sports folks um, saying, you know, there's so much work to do on the schools, why don't we do all that? I, I told them about the possibility of maybe two propositions and the like. Um, I don't know, before, <laughs> I, I was coming into this saying, you know, looking at what it looks like to the voter when you get onto the, you know, into the ballot booth, if you, you know, have a life and maybe don't watch every single minute of what we do here and the like, and you might say, what is, like, all these propositions, I have to pay all this additional money now, which we all know is not true, because that's something that the Communications Committee will make sure we let everybody know, um, that this is already money that is in our hands, so it's nothing additional to the taxpayers. But it, it, it gets very, very confusing, right? And the, the terminology that's used and the, the jargon that has to be put in here can get very confusing. And I would hate for people to have to deal with that. Um, but the whole idea of the two propositions, right, if the second one fails, because enough people say we want the money to go toward capital improvements in the, in the schools versus the field, um, to be able to take that money and put it toward that this is a tough decision now. And just because you brought that up, I was totally going with one proposition. <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I know that this work needs to be done. There's no, hands down, no issues. My question, I guess, is the first part, so let's say we go to two propositions. The first part passes, the second part fails. We have that additional $8, that $8 million to now go and put back in in the fall. Um, the additional cost of having another vote in the fall, right? Would that be another vote that we would have to put to the public? So there's that additional cost. Um, but the, if the first part passes, then we can go ahead with that, right? There's nothing, there, nothing needs to be held up until the second part is done. So um, my big issue would be the additional cost that it would require for us to go through the whole process of having to have another vote. Um, so as much as I think that's an interesting idea, I'm gonna go with the one proposition. Sorry, that was really long-winded. <laughs> I worked it out as I talked about it. John, and again, this is just discussion. We're going to have the formal vote a little ways down. Thank you. John? Yeah, Margaret, you're, you're right. There are lots of considerations for, for any action this board takes, and I think it's important that we be very mindful of that, be very methodical in our approach, and understand that every action that we take as a reaction and a consequence. And there are certain consequences that I don't think we as a district, a community, can afford is not moving forward with some improvements of our facilities. And I think the Facilities Committee has done a, a very good job of prioritizing what those items that need addressing now are. And I think it would be a crime if, one, the bond wouldn't pass at all, because that would create something that would be very hard to recover from, I think, as a community, and the kids would really suffer. So when I start thinking about, well, how do we make sure it passes, I know the Communications Committee is working very diligently to make sure that the word gets out and that there's great information out there for people to make an informed decision. I believe that the public can make a decision based on a variety of factors. And a proposition, I know in the past it was to us, maybe having two propositions might be too complicated for the public to, to swallow and, and pass through. Um, my view is that Cornwall, I've lived here 20 years, even though I'm still kind of considered an out-of-towner. I get that. My kids weren't born here. They were born in Valhalla. But at the end of the day, we can't afford it, and I think the way that we make sure that these things pass is to have a proposition, two propositions, uh, separating the facilities from the athletic field. And the reason for that is multifold, because there's lots of different considerations, and we can get into it. But just where I'm at right this moment, I'm, I'm supportive of having two propositions um, in order to, to get this bond uh, to pass. And my hope would be that both would be favorably looked upon by the community. Um, and I'll just leave it at that for now. On my microphone. <laughs> I hope everybody is watching and getting their joy for the evening. Okay. Um, we're going to have a lot of uh, 
things on the ballot on, on the vote, because we have this, we're going to be talking about the reserve fund uh, going back out now and replenishing our reserve fund. This, obviously a budget, and also three board members. And it does get confusing. But I don't think one other proposition is going to change that one way or the other, as far as how confusing it is or it isn't. I like to think that anyone who takes the time to vote, which isn't enough people in my opinion, will at least go out and know and take the time to know what they're voting for. It can't be much more important. I, I can't think of anything else that we don't vote for in our lifetime because certainly this affects us. The, 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 this is so tied right into our lives, our children and our grandchildren. So I do believe that the committee will do a good job in explaining this. And I have, a, I have faith in the public that um, they'll do their homework. I also, I've been through props for this kind of a thing in the past over the years. And sometimes, unfortunately, people need something to vote no on. I know it sounds bizarre, but it's true. They think no matter how many times you tell them that it, the money's there, they think that it isn't. It really isn't, and it's going to raise my taxes. And I think giving people the choice and saying, OK, we're, we're spraying all this out in front of you. And it's a lot, it's a lot to take in. And yes, there's a lot here. Um, but we feel that these are important enough to put them out in front of you, and you're grown up enough and intelligent enough to make your choices. You can vote for everything, or you can vote for yes or no for one or the other. The fact that I would go with the two props is supported by the fact that if the second prop, meaning the facilities, was approved, but the first prop wasn't, that you're done. It's not going to happen that way. Um, because basically the buildings, as much as I appreciate the facilities, as far as outdoors and sports, which is very important, very important, these buildings need work. We need to get that done. So I really, I, I firmly believe we should go with a, a, a two prop for this particular vote. Yeah, thank you. Um, so before I discuss one versus two, I just want to take a half a step back and say, um, to echo John's sentiment of, uh, and Margaret and Teresa, that, you know, this is very important work. Um, and the facilities we have uh, in our five school buildings, all but the high school, are between 50, the other four buildings are between 50 and 100 years old. Uh, and this work needs to be done not out of lack of work by our facilities crew, just when buildings get old, infrastructure work needs to be done on them. Um, before I sat on this board this year, uh, the board and the administration took the message uh, from the previous bond votes from the public and said, you know, we don't want to raise taxes just to deal with these. We want to take some of the annual budget and apply that to work on infrastructure. Uh, that message was received. We set up a capital reserve as a district, and we did that. So really what we're voting on here is we've saved a quarter and we can spend a dollar because the state will give us 75 cents. What you're voting on, we've already saved the quarter. It's already in our pocket. Do you want to spend a dollar or do you just want to have that quarter to spend? I mean, that's really what we're voting on here. Do you want to take free money from the state or no? It's a pretty simple decision. Um, so with that being said, I don't think this is, you know, I think a lot of the actions we take and a lot of discussions we have, in my mind, the answers are pretty clear cut. I think you can make very strong arguments one or two. I don't think that's a very clear-cut decision. Um, to me, um, I think the deciding factor, I'm in favor of putting it as one proposition. Uh, and the deciding factor is the work that we did with the Facilities Committee, which was not just a subcommittee of the board, but had members of the public, uh, had members of, of you know the teaching staff uh, on it. And not only did we say, here's how we want to spend the money that we have available to us today, but we laid out the plan for the next five to 10 years. Uh, and we put that in conjunction with what we're going to discuss a few items down of setting up another capital reserve. We have a plan in place to meet all of those facilities' needs. So if somebody were to vote no on item two and say we need to address those facility needs, 
uh, we have a plan in place to address those needs over the next five or 10 years. And we were confident working with uh, Walter uh, and working with Palumbo Group, working with the, you know, the building uh, and the uh, architecture group to say, you know, these needs, while they need to be done, they can wait five years um, for, for, the, for the second round of, of uh, funding. So I think it's safe to say with one vote, we know, okay, this is what we decided. We have the plan in place and we're gonna have another vote, we'll have that discussion, but I'm gonna be in favor of setting up another capital reserve. So assuming we set up another capital reserve, I'm in favor of one proposition. Yeah. <laughs> um, I agree with Jim wholeheartedly. Um, that a lot of work went in uh, with that group, and it was a relatively large group of people that were, were giving input in, uh, in the facilities committee. Um, the, uh, we do have a plan. And uh, again, we can, we can just, sorry about that. We can discuss that later. But the 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 part that has me worried is the last two propositions went down. If they had passed, our facilities would have been finished by now, done. Our buildings would have been up to snuff. Um, the uh, at a much lower cost than what this is going to cost us. That inflation has has eaten in, even forget about what's going on right now, but inflation has eaten into the last three years as to what we can actually get done with the same amount of money. Um, so that has me a little nervous, keeping it as one proposition. Uh, I have heard arguments against the uh, athletic facilities that are purely selfish, but they're telling me they're gonna vote no on it for purely selfish reasons, forgetting about the children, forgetting about what's good for our high school students. Um, that upsets me. And so for purely selfish reasons, people could vote down a single proposition just to go, I told you so. And, and uh, I, I had hoped the community would rise above that, but some of the people I've talked to, um, they haven't. And, and it, it bothers me a lot, it really does. Uh, I've sat on this board long enough to, to think that, that once that the community could really come together and, and act as one voice, and it's not happening right now. It's, it's, and I'm, I'm very upset over that. So because of that, I'm, I'm nervous about getting the bathrooms fixed because somebody doesn't want the facility at the high school. And that's really what I'm hearing mostly. I'm not hearing the big argument between the turfs, and that's for a later discussion. The bigger thing that is bothering me is they're complaining about the location. And we've had the discussion as to why it made sense to be where we've asked it to be placed. I don't want the whole proposition to go down because of selfish people, even though this will not raise their taxes. The argument, Jim makes a, a, a very valid point. The last time they went down could very well have been because it was going to raise taxes. And even if it was separated back then, I don't know what would have happened. Um, this won't raise their taxes. Both propositions will not raise their taxes. So um, right now, and, and I'm, I'm feeling too, I, I, I was dead set against two, but I'm feeling to be only because of some of the feedback I'm getting. Uh, I'm thinking too, but until it actually comes down to a vote, uh, I may change my mind again. <laughs> but. Keeping us in suspense. 
All right, so um, I'm going to talk, and then I'm going to give an actual answer. Um, <laughs> so I think there's... Uh, I'm just going to keep talking. I think there's... There's a bunch of things to... Uh, first of all, I think the level of discussion going on right now is fantastic. I can't say I disagree with anything anyone has said, even though you have said things that disagree with each other. Um, I do agree with uh, some of the things specifically that Jim said, particularly that uh, we do have a, a plan, and I think that the way I've always looked at it, and this is the way I've explained it to people, the the fields can only be addressed by a capital project. You know, we can't do that in-house. There's no alternative path. It's because people say, well, is it the most important thing in the district? So, you know, maybe, perhaps not. I mean, I'm sure you, if you mind the district's needs, you'd be able to find something that you could argue is more important. But we've got to look at it like we are trying to address everything and there are other paths to address those important facilities needs. There's no other path to getting this athletic facility done. Now, if we, my concern, I, mean, I've, I, I hear everybody's concerns. I hear the concern about two props. I hear the concerns about one prop. I, have, I share all those concerns. I just think if we, to play the, uh, the con on the, the two props for a second, I think if we put it on two props, we are not giving it a good chance to pass. I think we're kind of leaving it, uh, that prop kind of out to twist in the wind. And I think that this is probably, I don't want to sound dramatic, but this is probably our last chance for a long time to get the athletic fields done. Because if it gets voted down, um, I don't think there will be an appetite on this board or um, near future, near term future boards to take that on. So I think that it will, the fields will get worse and we will go through a whole, all the, the list of uh, other items before we ever get to it. Then there's a, another thing I actually just thought of Terry's mentioning, you know, let's say we did two, two bonds or two propositions, excuse me, and prop two, the fields failed. And we'd come back in the fall and say, well, we got $8.4 million. What do we want to spend it on? And then we come up with a list of $8.4 million worth of hardcore facilities items, let's just say. So if we're already entertaining the idea of quick turnaround plan B, it seems to me it would be the same process if we did one proposition with everything, and if that failed, We'd say, hey, we've already done the research. We already know how we're spending $15 million. There's no work there to be done, right? Nothing is going to change between now and September. We would be going through the same exact exercise, just trying to identify how are we going to spend that 8.4 that we would have spent on the fields. So we'd be in the same position coming back to the voters and saying, okay, how about $23 million pure facilities? I, I, I can be pessimistic about, you know, how people are going to vote, I, I think that second, I think we get the same result from that vote if we put an 8.4 million of, you know, uh, just an 8.4 million dollar facilities vote in the fall. I, I just think that would be the same. So, long story, somewhat shorter. I think if we're going to really make a good stab at getting this athletic project done, got to take a good stab at it before we. Because again, this, if we don't do it now, it's, it's not getting done for years. Um, so for that reason, I think we should put it as one prop, give it a good go, and if it doesn't pass, then we have other options, and we've already done the hard work of identifying you know, what those uh, backup projects would be. Thank you. So I agree with, again, a lot of what everybody's saying and sharing. Um, my personal opinion between the one and the two, as you, as you read them on uh, voting day, um, the idea of the two props identified kind of reads a little cleaner to me. So if we're talking about the concern of, of um, truly recognizing what's in front of you, uh, I believe this, the two propositions represents something that you can 
kind of follow like an A, then a B, and it's one, it's two, it's not quite lumped together. Um, you know, kind of to echo what Brennan said, um, as well as on what Terry said, you know, the idea of the idea of a fallback plan, a definitive fallback plan of if you know what's statistics, if this, then that, or um, you know, if if you if you separate into two propositions, and people choose to vote down the athletic complex, they're telling you we want more school, and we don't want athletics, because we're telling we're saying here tonight that we will restructure that. Eight point nine million dollars into more, more facility needs. Now that doesn't mean that some surface of a field won't get redone, or some some portion of drainage in a soccer field won't get complete. That's not saying that that's not viable for the what didn't make the first cut of the facilities. To me, it sounds like again you're almost giving three options, you know, by by presenting two with what what's been shared tonight. And, um, you know, kind of off the heels of what you shared, Larry, um, the, the history that I have on the board, this, might, this is my year four, the two bonds that I was exposed to, one coming in on and one being part of, um, it sounded like the people shared that they were displeased that a field was lumped in with um, educational needs. That's the sentiment I got um, by, the react, by the voting results slash you know, the, the post-process conversations you speak with, you know, John Doe on the street with, and you end up, you know, talking with some folks with. Um, I, I, too, do believe, Larry, that um, different folks have shared that they will not vote because they're displeased at the location. That's their focus. They're not pleased that our students could potentially get an $8.9 million athletic complex. They're displeased that it's not the way they want it. That's unfortunate, and you're not going to change that. It's that's everything. When I come to these meetings and I talk with folks and I talk with you guys and we make decisions and and, and things happen up here, first thing is on my notes is what's the best for the kids, for the children. I write down what what what's going to serve our students, our children, the best. What's going to serve them the best. Um, so to the point, I, I believe that I believe that two propositions shown on voting day is is what I'd prefer to see. Again, and if the fields do get uh, voted down, and that people choose not to vote yes for the fields, then that kind of tells a definitive story that they want more in their facilities than they do in the fields. Now, unfortunately, you are correct. If it is voted down, you won't see fields. You won't see the complex, the fields happen in, in I know my children's future and, and you know, some whoever's got young kids someplace, your young, young ones and, and your kids because it's an all in or nothing. You can't, you can't put a track, then you can't put an infield, then you can't put stands, then you can't, you can do that, but that's over, you know, 18 years. That's not, it's, it's you know, it's, 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 it's very, very challenging at that point. So I am I am a supporter of two propositions. So I'm I'm pretty torn between both of them. I probably would um, support the two propositions, but my opinion is, um, at this point, I truly wish I've been in this community 45 years, and before I served on the board, I was coming to board meetings and. I'm that crazy person that goes to town board meetings when they can, and I truly believe that when you go to meetings, you hear things firsthand. My other disappointment sometimes is that people don't listen when boards tell them information, not just this board, but any other board. They don't listen to the information that's given. Um, the, the upgrade that we decided on for the high school would serve almost half of the student population at the high school. So to think half of our student population at the high school would not be important, and that the only thing that should be important would be a very small percentage that plays football is really very sad. 
um, there, in my opinion. There's been a lot of um, misinformation going around, tremendous amount. Um, nobody ever said that the middle school fields would not be upgraded. That's part of the plan. This board, as a board, not just this board sitting here, but in the past, has been called out for not having future plans, a five-year plan. The, this facilities committee came up with a plan that takes it into the future. And there's a lot in there. There's a lot of substance in there. So to think that because some people feel like the fields needed to be upgraded at the middle school only is very sad to think that we would forsake half of our high school student population, and probably more, because having it there allows for students to to watch the sports going on and, and those sorts of things. So it's not just the athletes, which is almost half of our population at the high school, but it's also those extras with the kids that would be able to, um, to stay and watch games and take part in other things. So that part of it makes me very sad. Um, I, I very sad when we, we hear also the misinformation that, that some people in the community continue to think that this district has never taken care of things. In, in our own homes, we take care of things, but eventually those old pipes inside your walls are not something that you're going to take care of until you're at that point that you really need to rip the wall out. And so for, for some of the buildings, that's the point we're at. Um, we can't change that the high school, which is located in the town of Cornwall with a New Windsor address, um, is where it is. That was decided on years ago. We cannot change how it was built. That was decided years ago, before this board and before any administrator was here. Harvey, you're the, I think you're the longest. You and Walter showed up after the high school was built, correct? Megan, were you here then too? No, okay. So uh, there's, we have a great history in this district, but no one here is responsible for what happened over there, but has taken on the responsibility of fixing things and upgrading and that sort of thing. The community voted where to put that high school, but yet we still hear things about how, whatever. So moving on back to the propositions here, I'm sorry I digressed, but there's, my, my point in all this is there's a lot of um, community feelings that come in, obviously, but we, as Lewis said, we need to think about the students. Proposition, the first proposition with infrastructure would do so much within the buildings already. There's a plan to fix the rest of it down the road. And there's also fabulous plans to fix things in-house, um, which is a credit to, to Walter Moran and how he has upgraded and and also the district, how we have we have hired people to, to do in-house things that saves us a lot down the road. Um, the proposition for athletic facilities and upgrading, again, I want to emphasize, would service so many kids. Probably I would lean towards two propositions because we don't want everything to go down because of misinformation and because, as Larry pointed out, you know, somebody didn't get their way. And, and there's this big campaign going on to just let's, let's just vote it all down because it's not where I want it to be, which is very sad because it should be about the kids, it should be about the staff, and it should be about this district and the facilities that are here. Thank you. Terry, I'm gonna ask you to chime in. Uh, so I'll join Larry and, and just provide uh, perspective. Um, for me, my concern is we whatever tea leaves we're reading tonight, we have to make sure that our facilities get addressed, period, full stop. It, we will not tee up another vote better than what we're going to face in, in May. We will not in the next decade. So you might as well just write it off for the next 10 years uh, because it will not be teed up as well as it is. No increase to taxes, um, influx of funding from uh, federal uh, funds, um, and a lot of work uh, by, by a um, committee. So uh, for me, I've heard not a single speaker uh, come up and talk about we don't want improvements of middle school bathrooms, windows at COH, uh, flooding at Willow, uh, new cabinetry and lighting at CES. 
uh, in masonry at, at the high school zero. That, that is our community saying clearly we know our facilities need work and they're gonna support our facilities. What I have heard is the same thing that Larry has heard is unfortunately we are not united with regards to the athletics complex. So for me, I'm just trying to make sure that no matter what we do, our facilities must be addressed. We have a building condition survey that said our buildings are in disrepair. They did not say our middle school field was in disrepair. I'm not saying that our, our middle school field did not need work, but our building condition survey based on NYSED standards said our buildings need a lot of work and our plan addresses that. So whatever we do, one prop or two, our facilities must be addressed or we are a decade out um, before uh, we can even think about uh, getting some improvements there. Thank you, Terry. Anyone else from the board want to add to the discussion before we move on to the next item of business? Speak for her. But I believe Nina is the person who actually brought up originally um, the concerns about perhaps breaking it into two propositions, if you recall. Um, I'm not saying that's how she'd want to go. I'm just saying that, don't look at me that way, Larry. <laughs> <laughs> He's focused and paying attention. That's uh, no, no, he's, he's given me that look. <laughs> anyway, uh, anyway, I do, it was originally, I think, uh, Nina who actually said that she would like us to consider it. And I know she's on vacation and couldn't be here with us tonight, and it was important to her. That's all. Hey, Nancy. Go ahead, John. Thanks. So I'm not sure what a no vote on the second proposition would mean. I don't know at this point if it means that we're anti-athletics or the majority of the voters were anti-athletics or anti-athletic facility at the high school, or they were concerned about some of the things that we've heard in other districts, like Warwick being one of them. I think Harvey mentioned Warwick's uh, original athletic schema failed because of concern about environmental issue not the athletic facility. So, so there, it seems to me that there might be two groups that might come together to vote no, one that supports the athletic facility, yet doesn't like it where it may be or doesn't like the turf field associated with it, and another group that's anti-turf and all this other stuff that environmentally threatens the, env you know, the, 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 the environment. Cornwall has a great history when it comes to conservation, actually the conservation movement of America, I believe, was launched here to defeat the raping of Storm King Mountain back in the 70s. So, so I, I, I'm not sure what that means, but I would not assume a no vote on that B, if it were to get there, would mean that the public is against it. I think there's probably ways that we could determine what a no vote would mean through, I think about uh, uh, Jim was great, right? Jim would always uh, um, have his uh, uh, pollsters, the, the kids that were in uh, um, uh, a push at the high school would be doing a sensing session like exit polling to find out what was important. And I think, you know, I know we've spent a lot of time doing that, but maybe not to the detail that would be required to figure out what that was about. So I, that's just what I wanted to, to, to chime in on based on what I heard, that I don't think a no vote on the B proposition would be exclusively no against athletic fields. Just to put that's a all. very quick pin on that, I think that whatever we do, we, need, we do need to do a very robust exit poll if we are gonna be looking at what do we do if, you know, some things don't pass. Just uh, real quickly, um, I, I wanted to build on something Brendan said, but John, I would say a no vote on the athletics complex might not mean no on athletics, but I think it means no on athletics right now because we then need to figure out what that is, and that's a, a long, intensive, you know, that could be a process to figure out exactly what we need to do there. And I think there are a lot of voters who, if they're going to vote no, means not that we don't support athletics but we support doing the infrastructure first. And the point I wanted to build upon that Brendan said, and I think we've all said it, but I just want to really reiterate it. When we went through this as a facilities committee and identified all the needs as a district, we, we split them into a phase one and a phase two. 
the phase two list of needs is greater than $8 million. Mm -hmm. And to address that phase two list of needs, that's why we're having a discussion in a few minutes about another capital reserve. Mm -hmm. So to go out, if, a, if we split this into two propositions and the second proposition were to fail, we could quickly go back out with another vote in the fall and it wouldn't be, let's build a list from zero to eight million. It would be, here's the list. What are we gonna take off of this list to get it down to eight million? Mm -hmm. So that list has already been vetted. It's been through a full process um, and we, all those needs are identified and it's something that we could you know, do very quickly. So I just wanted to, you said that, but I just wanted to double down on it and make it more explicit. Yeah, uh, first of all, Teresa, I was sitting here agreeing with you. <laughs> For what, for what it's worth. I was, it I was, so I was agreeing with you. It happened so, so infrequently, Larry, that yeah, I wasn't yeah, sure. Yeah. Just, just because I happen to be able to hear you this time, that's all. <laughs> um, Being able to hear me is not something people have complained I've, I've, about. I've been listening to everyone. Brendan makes a, a very good point, saying that if it's one proposition and it goes down, we could then, in the fall, put up one proposition of just facility needs. Um, I made some notes, sounded like a good idea, but the more I'm, I'm listening and the more I'm hearing, um, that has now put off, again, the facility needs that we have. Um, if, uh, if it's in the fall, so that's another six, eight months down the road. And it's um, gonna be more expensive again uh, and it's just, so I, I have solidified my, my view after listening and whatnot. It's going to be too, I, I would like. Glad I can help. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, just check your tires when you leave. Uh, yes, I, I believe uh, two propositions is, is uh, appropriate. Okay, yeah, I, I was okay. just going to say Go the ahead. communications committee, we have a, a serious task ahead of us. Um, I really think that, again, you know, having visuals kind of like this, that's not, you know, reading all the, the legalese in the prop is crazy, but if you have this in your head, right, that says break down, this is what it means, um, I, I've decided that I, I'd rather go with two as well because it's so essential that the facilities work gets done, you know. That's it. It's just the facilities work has to get done and it has to get started now. So, yeah, I'm, when we vote, I'm going back to the two propositions. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Okay, moving on to item two, CEQA resolution. Whereas the Board of Education of the Cornwall Central School District, the board is proposing to undertake a project on various sites operated by the board, including Cornwall High School, Cornwall Middle School, Cornwall Elementary School, Willow Avenue Elementary School, Cornwall Hudson Elementary School District Office and various buildings and grounds, collectively school district buildings and sites consisting of the following building improvements, and I will take the rest as per document. Therefore, now be it resolved that the board finds and concludes that the proposed action is an unlisted action within the meaning of that New York Code, and it's further resolved that the board hereby declares itself the lead agency, and the board finds and concludes that the proposed action will not result in any significant, significant adverse impacts to the environment, and is further resolved that the board hereby issues a negative declaration with respect to the proposed action, and that resolved a copy of this resolution shall be sent to any involved or interested agencies. Do I have a motion? So moved. And a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Oh, go ahead, John. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, just, just a question, right? So, so we're the lead agency. That means everyone comes to us. So, I'll have Harvey answer that. And if any of the things that we, as a lead agency, have found, what liability would we possess as a lead agency on some of the assertions that? we're making based on guidance from the recommendations from the uh, um, architectural firm. Sure. So it's important to note that whatever assertions we make, 
we give notification to three key, three key agencies. One is the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. One is the Parks, um, Recreation, and Historical Preservation, as well as uh, the State Education Facilities Planning. This is uh, with an unlisted action where you have certain levels of involvement with respect to the, the land itself. Mm -hmm. um, this is what's required. They have not responded, which means they are in agreement with the fact of what we are saying that it has a negative impact. Not does not, I mean, a negative declaration. So in terms of legal liability, we really, I mean, anybody can sue anybody for anything, but right. we have followed all the necessary steps intended to protect the district. So, right. so procedurally, we're, we're, we're following the, the, the righteous Correct. Path. Correct. And these agencies that you mentioned, like the parks and, yep. and environmental, they could absolutely say something, but it's not required for them to say something and us to move forward, right? It's their responsibility to do, do their due diligence, and if they see any reason to intervene, they will. They, they can, but if they don't, silence is kind of consent correct. In, that, in that regard. That is correct. Is that right? Yep. Okay. Thank you. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carried. Thank you. Okay, item number three, resolution regarding one proposition to two propositions. Resolve that the Board of Ed hereby moves that there be two propositions to be submitted to the voters on May 17th, 2022 for capital improvements. Do I have a motion and a second? Discussion? I'll, uh, so we're choosing, we're only voting on this one because that was the result of the, the informal discussion. Is that right? So I will, Harvey, am I correct in how I'm doing this or no? Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, so second follow-up, um, I don't want to be a stickler on the language here, but uh, how set is this? And I'll point to one bit. I'm trying to put myself in the unknowing mind of someone who has just walked in. I don't really know, it, you know what we're, we're doing or how it's going to be paid for. And let's just take um, Proposition 1. Ba -ba -da -ba, numbers, numbers. So much therefore, thereof as may be necessary shall be raised. This is now talking about the $11.3 million after, you know, the uh, capital reserve fund shall be raised by the levy of tax upon the taxable properties of said school district. You know, to the blind eye, it makes it sound like, well, they are raising taxes. It comes later that um, in anticipation of such tax obligations of said school district shall be issued, which is... I don't know, is, is there any other other way we can word this to make it clearer that there is no increase to taxes? I just worry about that person who's just reading this, kind of doing all their research at right. the last second. It's like, well, it kind of sounds like a tax to me. All I can tell you is I can reach out to Bond Council and, and raise that, that concern. Okay. I'll but be, realistically. I'll be at the door saying, no tax increase. <laughs> no tax increase. <laughs> <laughs> We're, yeah, exactly. Those t-shirts that we're having made too, right? Yep, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Any other discussion? I'll, I'll, uh, just discussion. I'm gonna vote nay, but mm -hmm. that's just my opinion, and that doesn't mean that I don't support the vote. That's all. Okay. It's it's a quali it's a qualified nay. I'll uh, actually. I, I'm I'm kind of going back internally in my head. I want to be. I mean, we've all made our our opinion clear. I I very much respect that it's going to be two props, um, but I would I guess I wouldn't be true to what I just said if I voted yes. So I will be voting no, but I will. You'll have completely you know my hundred percent support. I think everybody made uh, acquitted themselves very well with their arguments. It, it in, in answer to or in, in addressing your uh, question about it looks like we're raising taxes, that's going to be your job to, no, make, I, to I, make sure. I, I was hoping to Harvey the, could do me a big <laughs> solid. Like, yeah, we can do that. That's fine. No pressure there. He's going to have magnets put on his car <laughs> everywhere. I, I may legally change my name to no tax increase Cardi until May 18th. Read his lips. Any other discussion? Okay, so I'm going to read the. I'm going to read it again. <laughs> Resolve that the Board of Ed hereby. Uh, 
hereby moves that there be two propositions to be submitted to the voters on May 17th, 2022 for capital improvements. We had a motion, we had a second. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Nay. Abstentions? Okay, motion carried, thank you all. All right, item number four, Capital Reserve Fund Resolution. I'm doing this right. <laughs> I'm on the correct item, correct? Yes. Okay. <laughs> it's the biggest agenda I've ever seen. Be it resolved that the Board of Education of the Cornwall Central School Di District does hereby authorize their following proposition to be put forth to the voters at the annual meeting of such voters on May 17th, 2022. Um, I'm gonna take that as per document. Do I have a motion? So moved. And a second? Second. Discussion? Nancy, I have a, a, a question on mm -hmm. this. So, so we already have a capital fund reserve. So is this capital fund reserve two? Yes. So the are there rules in terms of when we can access the funds in fund one and fund two? Or we can do them simultaneously or two before one? It, Correct. It, it, you, you have the flexibility. You as a board have the flexibility to determine and designate, but it still all have, always to be used has to go in front of the voters. In order to spend two, it would need to be voted on. Correct. In order to not spend one, or we, we can continue to vote, uh, uh, spending on one until uh, all funds are extinguished. Thank you. If I can, I ask a clarifying question based on that. We could spend it. You say it has to be voted upon to spend. It has to be voted upon to be bonded to be to get the state aid. If we were to just spend it dollar for dollar, we would need to vote on that. Just, I mean, that would not be a great decision if you can multiply any money your money for X. Any capital, any money coming out of the capital reserve needs to be voted on, even if you're not applying for the state aid. Yes. Okay. Interesting. And I. If I believe this to be true, but we have the existing capital reserve. Once it's spent, you can't replenish it. That to, is correct. It takes a vote to, mm -hmm. yeah. Right. You can only fill the cup once. Yeah. Right. Anyone else? Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions, motion carried, thank you. Okay, um, item number five is the discussion on turf fields, of which, um, and Terry, we need to make the decision today, correct? Yes. Uh, so uh, lots of uh, discussion, healthy debate, uh, but kicking the can is done. Uh, we need to start uh, making some decisions and, and moving forward. So uh, we provided a, a one-pager that just kind of states where we are, synthetic turf and the cost, natural turf and the cost, some of the summary of scope. Um, we have uh, talked about this as, as our team, um, and just based on everything that we've heard, listening to our community, uh, we would uh, offer a recommendation of the virgin rubber. Um, it, it says, one, we listen to everyone about some of the risks and, and things of that nature. Um, the cost is already kind of encapsulated in our facilities uh, committee's um, thoughts. As I think back to the facilities committee's last meeting, that was where we were kind of leaning towards was how can we make it a bit safer just to kind of alleviate some uh, of the concerns in our uh, community. Uh, so synthetic turf with uh, the EPDM uh, virgin rubber uh, would just be our recommendation. Um, the other just recommendation that we would have is to um, say absolutely not to natural turf uh, because in one year's time, we're going to be right back here talking about how muddy and messy the field is, what are we going to do to replace it. Um, it, it does not solve our uh, problem. The, the problem that we're trying to solve is how do we have a, um, a, a surface that all of our athletes uh, can, uh, can play on uh, that will last us 
uh, a good amount of time. So the natural turf is, is a significant concern for, uh, for our team. Okay, so we're gonna have a discussion on this and then we will be taking a vote on it as well. So, M Margaret, you wanna start or just, oh, oh go around. The, did we want Larry? Yeah. Okay, Larry, you can start. Yeah, go back the other way. <laughs> okay, um, I've been, over the past couple of weeks, I've been doing a lot of reading uh, and I've been, um, Remembering discussions we've had uh, over many, many, many board meetings of the conditions of the field, why are they that way? Um, mostly because of overuse, uh, because we don't have enough fields for our teams. Um, I, I do believe that we need an artificial turf field and the uh, virgin rubber infill is, is the way to go. I mean, I could spend the next 20 minutes going over all the things that we've already discussed as to why. Uh, and I, I, ha I have read, I am not a toxicologist, um, but I have read a lot of toxicology reports and um, there are so many left-hand says this and the right hand says that. And, and uh, as with any data I have found, you can always find something to agree with your thoughts. And uh, so I'm, I'm just going with how I feel about forgetting about the toxicology end of it, which I know um, some people will, will take issue with, um, but the, the need for our uh, fields, the, um, the need for our uh, teams to play on, on uh, appropriate fields. And I am sure that it, it, as the time goes on, we will address the uh, grass field at the middle school. Um, as I had mentioned before, um, we're gonna have to address the grass field at the middle school because if we work on the high school, whether it's grass or artificial, that field will not be usable. So we're gonna have to make sure the middle school field is usable. Uh, and then when that hopefully will last long enough to have the high school field in play again. And if we put grass at the high school field, that's gonna be at least two years out because if we plant grass, it takes another year for it to grow which means the um, middle school is gonna get used, overused again, and we're just gonna be back and forth in the same, right back where we started from. So um, I'm, I'm, I believe uh, the artificial turf with the uh, virgin rubber and fill is the way to go. Thank you. Yeah, so I um, just wanna go through a, a go through this from every angle I can think of, partly so that everyone knows that we've been listening. And I think there's been a lot about this issue. So um, I think the argument over health and safety can generally be uh, divided into two groups. On the one side, there's player injury, and the other side, there's toxicology, let's just say. So just to, to talk about the, the player injury part first, just want to remind people of some of the stuff that we've learned uh, collectively over the last couple of weeks. So uh, doctor, part of Dr. McNitt's presentation, he mentioned that at the NFL level, uh, players on synthetic turf have 16% more uh, lower body injuries than on natural grass. But he was quick to point out, those are natural grass fields maintained at the NFL level. So these are, I mean, this is the absolute top of the top. They're reseeded after every season, um, which is not something that we can do, unfortunately, in high school. These are used very specific, very sparingly just for this purpose. A high school field, we're going to be practicing on, or I mean, I can imagine multiple practices every day on top of games for 10 months out of the year. I mean, this field will get torn up. And it's just not, it's not plausible that we would reseed a field every two years as would be necessary because then we'd have 
a large portion of our athletic program with nowhere to go. And then you start talking. The irony is, <laughs> I thought about this, you go with a natural turf field, you have to start relying on third parties because when you're reseeding, they're going to have to end up playing on artificial turf. And you will have no say in how that was constructed, what infill, et cetera. So, um, and then to, to the point about injury, Mr. Dr. McNitt pointed out that actually at the high school level, there were some studies done of these lower body injuries at the high school level. And in one study, the, it was a wash between the two. In another study, actually there were more injuries on grass. And the inference was that, and this was his opinion, which I've heard echoed elsewhere, a properly maintained synthetic turf field is safer for injury than a poorly maintained grass field, which is what you get at high school level. So putting that part of the you know, health of players, injuries aside. I think synthetic turf is the way to go there. Then there's the, like the other side of it, which is the, the toxicology. And I think there, so even within that, there's like two groups. There's the, the, the grass and the dirt, the fake grass and the fake dirt. So we've heard um, some concerns about PFAS in the plastic grass. Um, and I, I'm, I'm sure as everybody else has done, I've, I've done a fair amount of reading on this over the last months really now. So a couple of things I just want to point out, I and mean, it should be noted, PFAS is one of the most common chemicals uh, in modern manufacturing. It's been that way since 1930, or the 1930s. Um, and there was a, a study done by the American Chemical Society. They took 200-plus two, consumer-grade products, and they tested them. 48% had PFAS in them already. And these are things that become, frankly, are, are in every home. Uh, they're in this room. Um, wrappers for food, um, plastic utensils, um, non-cook, non-stick non cookware, stuff that is, the, the, the proximity to your, um, your mouth, you know, you're, you're much more likely to ingest it through these means, to the point where 98% um, of American adults have PFAS in their system already. I'm bringing all this up because I just don't know if this is a valuable metric for determining whether something, whether we can use something or not. We, we just simply can't apply this standard to everything. We would have to knock our buildings down and start from scratch. Um, and the, the risks of PFAS are very much tied to exposure, um, amount of exposure, and time. You'd have to ingest a lot of it over a long period of time, which I, I don't see those, that being the case with a synthetic field. Um, then there's the question of the infill. I think the... Um, yeah, so the, the crumb rubber, it seems every study that I've read has, um, it, it has said generally that the, the toxicity is, is low and, and doesn't seem to have an impact on, on children. I am willing to hedge on it, and for this reason. Uh, even some of the studies, um, by their own admission, have, have said that they're incomplete and you know, they're not as, uh, you know, there's more study to be done. Um, so... The EPA actually stepped in in 2016, and they're launching, they're in the process of a very comprehensive study, what's considered like kind of like the gold standard. Um, and the study was in two parts. Part one was studying the chemical composition of crumb rubber. Study uh, Part two was determining its impact on human health. Part one is in. It was in, 20, in 2019. It was submitted. Largely agreed with all the other literature, I think, that we've all seen, that it's kind of a negligible impact on human health as far as they, can, uh, as far as they could tell. But the study on long-term impacts to human health is not in yet. And that is enough to give me pause to say, all right, well, this is worth a hedge. Because we don't want to be in a position in a few years, this study comes out, says crumb rubber is tied to X, Y, and Z. Everybody rushes out to replace it. And you know, if you think supply issues now are, an issue, are, are a problem, when every school district in America you know, runs to replace this stuff, that's just not a position you want to be in. Um, initially, I was with the, the virgin rubber. The, the one that has really caught my eye, however, now is the cork infill, because it's in the same price range. Um, I, I, I think that the cork infill, to me, is the true hedge, because it's, a, it's organic. You know. The argument, I mean, I could see a scenario where the, what is in the, what's in uh, virgin rubber is the same stuff that's in crumb rubber, like we may end up being in the same position. Um, and the cork also, I, I've actually spoken to people who, um, 
very familiar with these fields say it actually is the best organic as far as like imitating the feel of the chrome rubber, like it actually feels like dirt. You don't have to water it, which is a, a, an improvement or a, um, a benefit over some of the other organics. And um, another benefit, it, one of the things we heard from Dr. McNitt was that synthetic fields are hotter. They retain a lot of the heat. The chrome rubber uh, is the big driver of that. And cork actually uh, does not retain heat, so, or nearly as much. So your, your surface temperatures are much lower. So, you know, I think that, um, again, it's within the same price range. To me, if we're going to hedge on crumb rubber, I say let's go all the way and do cork instead of the virgin rubber because we, I, I would feel much better knowing we don't have a surprise coming our way in a couple of years if once the second half of that EPA study comes out. And look, if that study comes out and it says, hey, crumb rubber is fine. We've looked at it from every angle. When we replace the top level of the turf, then we can revisit that. Um, but I think for the time being, a synthetic field, cork infill is checking every box that I think we can reasonably do. Thank you, Dr. Cardi. <laughs> I am although, not. Although you're a not a toxicologist. Um, yeah, so I looked at all those. As he said, Ren, other options. Um, and the crumb rubber, I think you there's an added cost of the, the, the rubberized, the base. There's a cushion course that's underneath the rollout turf. I think there's an added cost there that would drive up the unit, the square foot unit price, but to be looked into. I was, yeah, the cork. I, I, I believe the, the crumb rubber does not, a lot for a rubber, a rubber mat, a cushion mat underneath, where I believe the cork requires a cushion mat underneath. Again, so the the infill cost is roughly comparable, but I think there's a uptick in the cushion underneath. Um, so as a as a general note, I, I looked, you know, who didn't look at a million different things, right? If you if you wanted to, you wanted to prove that the sun was actually, you know, blue. You could find a website to prove the sun is blue. So it's it's you know kind of your position. Um, as as it relates to the usage of the fields, I think that I think that we should have a turf field. I think we should have a turf field based on the amount of teams that we have, based on the amount of um, um, usage that occurs, even on our our field that we only want our football team to play on, which is kind of exclusive. Um, that gets overused. There's two schools that bookend that field that the kids are on it. There's um, pick a Saturday or Sunday you want to drive by, pick an evening you want to drive by, that there's people playing on that field. There's people playing on the other soccer field. There's people playing at, at, you know, at Willow. There's people using our, our facilities everywhere. Now, that may be a, a good problem to have. They're all going to want to go to the high school now and play on the, you know, the, the new turf should it, should it go through. But I do believe we need uh, a turf field. If we're gonna if we're gonna head in the direction of building a facility, I believe it has to be uh, turf. I think that the idea of grass infilling uh, in in the infield of a rubberized track is just going to be problematic because it's going to get used. There's equipment that has to go over it. Not that it's going over it now, um, um, but it, it adds a, a different a different level to it. You're going on it with different tires, different you know different ways you you traverse the rubber uh, track. Um, and the idea of attempting to replace an infield, I think our history has taught us that we don't do it. We don't, we don't do that. We didn't do it at a middle field. We didn't, in my term, my time living here in Cornwall, I've not seen that middle school field, you know, with any great attention place, uh, you know, paid to it. I know um, Walter, you know, knocks the sock off the ball by using the fertilizers he's allowed to use, the SED allows us to use. We can't just go to Home Depot and buy, you know, 1055 and 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 haphazardly spray it out. He's he's severely restricted on what he can do with the earthen areas um, in the school system. And I think he does a great job. But I think in the terms of when you use the word field, and if you've really gone out to that field and walked from yard line to yard line, take the numbers and walk down, turn around, take the numbers and walk back, take a minute and walk it and look it, it's a field. And it's it's not in a field. It's not a football field. It's not a soccer field. It's a field. It's it's, it's in, in in poor shape. Um, it's over compacted. 
Um, and it needs attention. It needs attention. I think we've all recognized that that area needs attention, and future future uh, facilities plans and meetings will will attend to those. Um, I think the growing season logistics, Larry, as you mentioned, is is an indicator that you want a turf field so you can play. So you can play. So it's not you know in the summer you got the burnout, and then into the fall where you're typically would have a fall growing season. You got the kids trampling on it. You got the kids playing on it. And that's what they're supposed to do, but it restricts it. And then what do you do in the spring? You try to grow grass again in the spring. You, please don't use our fields, everybody. Well, we know that we know that doesn't happen. Um, so I am a, I am a proponent of a, of a turf field. Um, all the technical points you made, I, you, you kind of, I read most of the same, Larry, as well. You, you can find one that supports, one that's opposed, and look, Switch them, and they, you know, you, you can just almost interchange them. Um, so, and then, you know, at some point, you have to pick your head up out of the data and just look around a little bit and just what's what are trends, what are people doing, what's happening. Doesn't mean they're right, doesn't mean they're wrong, but you pick your head up. So I went, I went, and I, I, uh, I uh, our esteemed neighbors to the south, um, West Point Military Academy. If you drive and look around there, they have almost almost 11 and a half acres of turf field. Almost 11 and a half acres. That's that's just. I mean, I can go through the list of all they are: practice fields, rugby, uh, you know, physical fitness fields, men's, women's soccer, Mikey Stadium, you know, the, the, their pilot field. It would seem that if the off gassing and the chrome rubber idea that it is toxic, it would seem that they would have. This toxic wind wafting about West Point, and that would, and and you know, it just doesn't make sense. You know, you, if it's if it's if it's that hazardous, and again, you can find anything you want on the internet to support your support your point either way. Um, and to the truth, I don't know if they have crumb rubber. I don't know if they have cork. I don't know if they have sand. Um, and you know, again, you take your head up out of the data for a minute. You look around. When you go down the list of Section 9 teams that participate in Section 9 and you look at who has, who has turf fields, I don't see, I didn't, I've not heard or seen, or when you ask anybody, I've not seen an opt-out program where our students have the ability to opt out of playing on those fields because of their personal beliefs of the toxicology that may be or may not be present in their field. Um, so again, when you pick your head up out of the data, again, just look around a bit and just kind of put a practical sense on this. I don't. I didn't. I didn't see anything readily available in the Section Nine arena. Um, so it gets to the infill, I think, and um, I'm not completely sold on the on the crumb rubber. I am opposed to using some type of recycled crumb rubber that existed somewhere else and was on an automobile or as an tractor in a field. I am uh, vehemently vehemently opposed to utilizing any material like that. Um, you bring up the cork, Brendan, I don't, for again, dollar for dollar, I am not opposed to entertaining a, a cork infill. Um, the, the heat is kinda what was, it seemed good for that. Um, I know it talks about migrating materials and may need a little more attention on our maintenance folks' behalf, but if that's right, then that's right. Um, then we should do it. Um, but I, I'm gonna leave an, an open end a bit and I want to say that, yes, I, I think that our district needs a turf field, and I could argue uh, the infill. I pass the baton. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I thank you all for your wealth of information that you've shared already, so it's really amazing. Um, I'm going to lean towards a turf field. Um, Walter has not been able to tell us where he would locate his sod farm yet. Um, that's been my little inside joke, but um, natural turf needs sod. You can plant grass. You really need sod, and the sod needs to be replaced. And that was um, that was one of the things that um, that we heard from Dr. McNitt, and it makes sense. Um, I'm not opposed to the synth synthetic turf at all. I think it's time for us to move to where we could um, best service our kids and more teams, and get it to where they can play year round on these fields. Um, as far as um, as far as potential for toxic substances, um, I really believe that what we've heard, again, there's two sides to every story. 
What we have heard is um, both sides. These kids are playing and then they're off it and they're not living on the fields. The other thing that I would say is um, we are all exposed to toxins every second of the day. And until everyone is eating pure organic foods with no pesticides, that every vegetable they eat is organic and every fruit they eat is organic and every piece of meat or, or poultry that comes across their plate was raised in regenerative agricultural sustainably without use of non-organic feed, um, then there's so many opportunities for toxins to enter everyone's body. And so to say that certain players developed disease because of playing on turf, I really believe that you would have to know their entire background. Was there environmental toxins in their home? What type of, of um, cleaning substances were they exposed? Just home things that every day we are all bombarded with. So there's such a massive amount of of complexities and things that could impact everyone's health. Um, I don't believe that this is going to be problematic at all. Um, I think it's a, it's a very good solution. I think that um, there are so many things out there that impact our health on a daily basis that to say this is going to be um, something that's bad, I. I don't believe in that. I really don't. I think that, again, there's there's all different sides to the story. Um, for me, I, yes, we can see where we can, we don't have to make a decision on what type of fill we're going to use. We could certainly upscale that if we feel that that's the best way to go. Um, but I feel that um, turf for our teams would be the way to go um, for our facilities. I think sticking with grass, uh, especially in this area, is is not going to be able to service if you just the information here and I, I thank you guys for giving us this to look at um, you have a lifespan of natural turf is one to two years um, you're not going to be regrowing grass Walter has definitely tried to do that um, and he has tried to do as best as he can do but um, you're not keeping the neighborhood kids off of off of fields when no one's around and and even when stuff is regrowing and Fields shouldn't be used. People are still using them, and that, that's just a fact of life. So um, I think that um, the synthetic turf would be the way to go, and if we could get the best um, the best fill that we could get, and I think that that would be the way to go as well. Jim? Thank you. Um, so I'll try to be brief. I, I sort of thought of this in three areas. One is uh, the cost slash usability. Uh, second is the safety for play, and then third is the overall safety toxicology. So when it comes to the costs, um, you know, we have the document here. It's a little bit more upfront, obviously, for the artificial versus the natural. Uh, as far as the replacement over the lifespan of eight to 10 years, it's very similar. Um, but that's not really a fair comparison because you really need three, four, five grass fields to get the usability of one artificial field. So obviously when you look at that and you look at the usability, the costs would be far higher with grass because you just can't use it um, uh, with the nature that you can use the synthetic turf. So I think uh, on that cost slash usage, it, it, it breaks very heavily towards the synthetic. Uh, as far as the safety for play of the athletes, I think Brennan cited uh, you know, what Dr. McNitt said about the lower leg injuries. I just, I, I won't repeat it. Uh, I agree with that. Um, as far as the toxicology slash overall safety, uh, I think we've all done a lot of reading on that. Uh, Mr. Encano, who's in the office, in the audience, uh, has been, you know, uh, giving us information and speaking. Um, so I'll make two quick points about the toxicology. Uh, this is quote from your letter that you had sent to us from the National Center for Health Research in uh, Washington, the think tank, non-governmental organization, whatever you want to call it. Uh, scientific evidence of cancer and other systematic harm. It is essential to distinguish between evidence of harm and evidence of safety. Companies that sell and install artificial turf often claim there is no evidence of children harmed or no evidence that artificial turf causes cancer. This is often misunderstood as meaning the products are safe or are proven not to cause harm. Neither is true. It is true that there is no clear evidence that an artificial turf field has caused specific children to develop cancer. However, the statement is misleading because it is virtually impossible to prove any chemical exposure causes one specific 
individual develop cancer. So, you know, it's, it's asking, it's basically, it, it, the letter here admits there's no proof that it causes cancer. And then it says, well, now we've got to prove a negative. We've got to prove that it's absolutely safe. That's not really a fair standard to hold the field to. So the, the letter you know, from the group saying we need to really think about the safety of this explicitly states, there is no clear evidence that an artificial turf field has caused specific children to develop cancer. So there's no evidence of that. It's almost impossible to prove without us, you know, this is very safe. Um, so then I, I, um, the second piece is um, the state of Washington, the University of Washington, the women's soccer coach, uh, forgetting her name, um, said, you know, I have my players, they're developing this cancer. Well, the state of Washington conducted a study. And they said, actually, when we study this as a statewide population, soccer players have actual less incidence of cancer than the overall population of the state. Uh, and they proposed that's probably because there's exercise and the health of, of, associated uh, with getting regular, regular exercise from playing on that turf. So if one of the leading things in, in the public discourse has been, hey, these soccer players get cancer, but then we conduct a study and find out, well, that's actually not true. And a think tank which is asking us to question this specifically says it's not proven to cause cancer. You know, we're sort of being asked to prove a negative. And it's almost, a, you know, you can't prove that nothing causes cancer. So I'm safe. I guess the bottom line, and, and to Lewis's point, we have to look around, not just our county. I mean, there's, I think, 10,000 of these fields in the country, Dr. McNett said, you know, thousands, if not close to 10,000 in Europe. They've been around for decades. I think if there was a smoking gun, we would have seen it by now. Uh, I would feel completely safe for my children, and my children are all young right now. They're all elementary school and younger, so they will have the opportunity to play on this field, and I would feel completely happy, no reservation, to let my children play on this field. Um, so I'm fine voting for artificial turf um, for our community. Uh, to the matter of the infill, I support the uh, virgin rubber infill. Um, I'm not necessarily opposed to the cork, but just based on what we heard from Dr. McNitt, to me that didn't really sound ready for prime time. It seemed a newer technology and that it needed some more ongoing maintenance, and he's talked about growing the weeds, and the playability might not be quite the same. Um, open, I don't know if we have ability to change, to talk about the infill later than this. I don't know if that needs to be decided tonight, if we, no, wanna, if we wanna keep parsing this down to smaller and smaller pieces. Um, but, you know, my, my gut says the virgin rubber is the way to go. Um, but, I, you know, to me, that the, the, the cork or the coconut just didn't quite seem ready for, for prime time, so. Thank you. Larry? But pay attention, I have my mic on now. <laughs> you got, it's a long night. Okay. First of all, I, I don't follow the premise that it's either or. To me, it, there is either some kind of artificial turf or there is no fields. Um, we're not a big enough school district that we have numerous fields where we can play on different fields while we refurbish a field. Um, we can't keep children off a field. It's a public school. Um, so it, you know, years ago or at one time when I was associated with a much bigger school district, we had several different fields so we could rest one and move to another. You can't do that here. You just don't have that. That's the first thing. So to say, well, we're, we're choosing between artificial or natural turf, I don't know if that's necessarily the case because I don't know if there is a choice. I think what it comes down to is that what we have now, because I kind of went and drove past the fields, I don't have children playing on them, what you have looks like um, something in a horror movie like, a craters of the moon or something like it, it it's horrible the fields right now so as far as dangerous that's dangerous as well so i don't know how we could even keep those fields going much longer unless we did something with a um an artificial um substance that's the first thing on a personal note i'm very sensitive to this because um you talk, Nancy said very well about environmental issues. Now, my son at 19 had cancer. 
And I could directly tell you he never stepped foot on a football or a soccer or any other. He, he played tennis. Uh, I guess he was a yuppie. I didn't know it then. Um, but never, never stepped on any of those fields. Wound up with uh, lymphoma. And I pulled him out of, uh, my husband and I pulled him out of college in tenth, uh, second year of college. And he was in Sloan Kettering for six months and got 26 radiation treatments. Now, I lived near Nipera Chemical. It's an opinion. It's a good opinion. I read all the reports. I know exactly what was down there, peridium, all that kind of stuff. And that's environmental. And you know what? Just as they had all the statistics from Nipera and whatever name they changed it to that showed, oh, this has no influence at all, that wasn't the case. But there's nothing you can do about it. Having said that, I also know that if you go, I take my grandchildren to gym, gymnastics, and every part of the gym is rubber, rubber flooring, rubber mats. Um, you know, every it's true, everywhere you go, I try to reduce the amount of carcinogens. Well, with me, I'm kind of old by now. It doesn't really matter. That horse is left to, to gaze. But like with my grandchildren and my children, we're very aware of that, but it's everywhere. So I don't want to make the determination by saying, I'm going to say no to artificial turf, because in the long run, I think it's equally, it makes the decision then that our children, there will be children that will not be able to play sports. It just won't happen. And I don't, I don't think that's fair, because I think that's a health issue as well. Uh, I think we need to keep our kids healthy and, and active. So when it, it, when it comes down to it, um, I would love to have grass. But when you have a population, it's not like it was in the 50s or the 60s. It's just a different world we live in. So I would, I would have to support, with a little bit of my nose being held, um, artificial turf. And I also want to thank, um, because there was some talk about um, Dr. McNitt, the non-toxicologist, toxicologist. And I have to say that the fact that you brought him here actually created in my, I, you, you, I think, did a great thing because you made me feel more uncomfortable when I left here after listening to him, which actually is a good thing when you think about it, which meant I didn't feel that he was just coming in here with some line for a board of education. Because um, one of the people that wrote in, uh, and I think an email to the committee, the Communications Committee, uh, stated that one of the things that threw me was when the, Dr. McNitt said that the um, NFL would never have their players put in danger, which the minute he said that, I said, oh my God, they do it every day. I mean, yes, they, they don't care about their players, which is quite obvious by some of the brain damage we see. Everything, there were a lot of things I questioned, but it still always comes back down to what we're subjected to every day, every hour, every minute in our lives, and the fact that it's either children play or they won't play, or even worse, some children will play, but not all children will play. So I go for the artificial. Well, how do you follow that? I'm going to try, but uh, nice you'll, you'll, you'll manage. I, so, I, I have faith. I don't want to restate what's already been stated, and I agree with much of what has been said. From my perspective, it's about are we able to manage the risks? In order to, to answer that question, first you have to identify the risks. And I think Dr. McNitt, the other night, two weeks ago or so, uh, did a very good job of discussing what the non-chemical risks associated with turf fields are and how we could mitigate it. And I think the AD actually uh, chimed in about at least one of those risk factors, which happened to do with temperature. And New York State already has a, a threshold that says that you know, when the ambient temperature is this, guess what? No one's playing on the field. And when it's this, you have extra breaks and blah, 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 blah. Right? So, so that, I think that was very constructive in terms of getting me comfortable from the non-chemical side. Right? 
the chemical side, and I'm like many of us, all of us, not a toxicologist, but you know, I did sleep at a what Motel Six last night or Holiday Inn, and so I've been reading a lot on this. And, and in reading about the, the, the dangers, I didn't see where it was the actual synthetic turf itself. The danger is in the infill. And it has to do with the, the crumb fill, which is made out of recycled tires. But even a virgin tire is still a tire that possesses a variety of of uh, volatile organic compounds, which are known to be carcinogenic, full stop. So in my further readings, I came across, because I'm going to Europe this summer, come hell or high water, I've been reading a lot about what's going on in the debate in Europe. And they seem to be a lot further ahead in some of these things, especially when it comes to VOCs, volatile organic compounds, than the US. Mm -hmm. we have a, we have a terrible track record in the states. Europe seems to be at the cutting edge and a lot more sophisticated in their approach, for whatever reason. I was introduced to a animal that Europe uses to see the impact on this animal and then translate it to possible impacts on humans. Everyone says, well, if you do that in the states, you use mice, right? You, they use mice all the time for, for drugs and the like, right? And for other types of things like uh, um, cosmetic products. Well, zebrafish are used in Europe. Specific, they were subjected to tests when it pertained to this infill, crumb infill. And what they found happened to these fish. And what's interesting about these fish is that Adult fish aren't that well impacted, right? Because their bodies are mature and they haven't developed, or they have developed. But these immature fish that are, let's call adolescent and younger, had incredible problems when they were subjected to these teas that they made out of this crumb rubber. And that caused me great pause, because I don't need to know where the science is right now. And if that answer, if, if this issue was, is it safe or not, ever gets answered. All I know is that based on that zebrafish and what happened to that zebrafish, and not just one, but schools of zebrafish, based on certain levels of exposure to, to chrome rubber, that it was enough to suggest that we need to be very precautionary when we're putting young kids on these types of fields. Adults, hey, go with God, you're fully mature, your systems have been fully developed. But for young kids, they're developing. And as they get exposed to this stuff, they could be hazards. Whether they are or not, the future will say. But from my own personal conscience, I can't support dealing with a synthetic turf that would possess chrome rubber. Because the consequence is too great. I'm not gonna support something that in my heart of hearts suggests that, you know, I don't know. And when I don't know, I become very more cautious. That's the risk manager in me, right? Until I find out the facts. We may know in five years. We may know in 10 years. But God forbid we find out in five years that this was a huge mistake and the public was duped because of all the money that's at stake. And so I understand the exposure to PFAS, just like radiation, right? You walk the streets of Manhattan, you're being irradiated by the buildings every day. OK, it, to, to your point earlier. But when I get back to this infill issue, Brendan's spot on. Cork. I believe is the way forward. And it does have sand, and sand does have some issues associated with it. And there's percentages that we could deal with. But from my perspective, if it's good enough for Bronxville School District, 
which is the number one school district in this state, it's good enough for Cornwall. And that's why I believe cork is the way forward if we're going to do synthetic fields. And I do believe we need to do synthetic fields because the grass fields that we have are inadequate for a variety of reasons, OK? Not enough dollars to make them good is really the bottom line. And having a multi-sport field is essential to alleviate the congestion that currently exists. So how do we get there? I think the way we get there is just as Brendan offered earlier on, is finding that product that is safe, that we can apply this precautionary principle to and move forward and get the kids on these fields. So I am, and I'm not sure how this, because we don't have a resolution here, but, but, but from my perspective, I can support turf fields if it includes infield that's cork. Just kidding. Um, so I, I agree with what everybody said, all the points that everybody's made. Um, I actually wound up speaking to the folks at Buildings and Grounds who are in charge of our current field maintenance, figuring why not talk to the people who do this on a daily basis and what it takes. Um, they're pretty much in favor of the synthetic turf as well. A big discussion was around the middle school football field, um, the amount of work that it takes to try and keep it play worthy during a season is extensive. It was pointed out to me that if you go to the end zones, the grass is lush and beautiful and not compacted. The soil is not compacted. Why is that? Because everybody plays in the middle of the football field. <laughs> Gym classes are there. All the, the, you know, everybody's playing because you want to be in midfield, you know, when you're, when you're practicing. Um, I heard about the amount of time that it takes, despite the fact that that field is in such bad shape, there's a lot of work that goes into that. Um, there are so many elements, again, for when it boils down to it, we just don't have enough land for enough fields to help all of our teams, to give all of our teams playing time. So if we have a synthetic turf field at the high school with you know, the, the, the type of fill is uh, definitely worth more conversation. But you can have those teams that can now play on that field. And we have a limited number of buildings and grounds folks who are field maintenance people. Um, if we have a, a synthetic turf that requires a little less work, that means that those same people can now spend more time on the other fields that we have, the football field, the soccer field. One of the interesting elements I heard about the soccer field <laughs> is that um, it's in bad shape. Why is it in bad shape? Because there are divots all over the place. Why is there divots? Because the shot put and all of the field from track and field, they throw their shot puts onto the soccer field. Now there are all these big divots that have to be taken care of so nobody breaks an ankle. You know, So it's a lot, a lot of work. If we had more space or more of an opportunity for more teams to play on a field, that would really uh, you know, open up the, uh, the buildings and grounds folks, the, the grounds especially folks, to be able to really focus on the other fields as well because it wouldn't require them to do so much work um, on one specific field. Um, again, you know, the, the amount of time that they were telling me about, about all the work that they do with the seeding and, you know, all the things that you're supposed to do, you're supposed to let a field rest for a year. That doesn't happen. We just don't have the space for that. Um, so the, the, the crumb rubber is, is an issue, and I would, I would definitely talk about uh, the cork more so. But to that end, you know, with the synthetic turf, when you have somebody like Dr. McNitt, who this is a big part of his life, is researching, you know, turf fields and natural grass, and, and um, short of us having a sod farm and the ability to rip up the sod and replace it, which we, we know we can't do, the fact that somebody who's in, up to his, his, his hips in this information says that he's okay with his own children and grandchildren playing on synthetic turf kind of gives me you know, a, a good feeling that synthetic turf is not a bad situation, that it's, it's definitely something. And again, you know, if we had more space 
And if we could have fields all over the place, if we, you know, owned NEMA and had 18 fields there, then we could talk about natural grass. But I really don't think that that's a possibility. So I, uh, I'm 100% for the, for the synthetic turf, but with, a, you know, either the cork or the, uh, the virgin rubber as an infill. That's all I got. And I'm not a toxicologist. Nancy. Go ahead. Um, after listening to my esteemed colleagues, um, I would I would say uh, um, I'm leaning more towards cork than I am to the uh, virgin rubber because of some of the things pointed out tonight. Um, I'm still in favor of a artificial field, um, but as you said, err on the side of caution. Quick, quick question, because we've brought up something. I read, I didn't look into cork very much, frankly. I know it was on the list of, of items. Um, like most things, though, if we're going to be discussing cork, then we need a heck of a lot more information. Because honestly, there's nothing to indicate that we couldn't find out in five years from now that cork is an issue. I, I, no, I mean, there's a lot of organic things out there, like, you know, that kill you. You know, strychnine, I mean, things, you know. There's, they're organic, they're healthy. Oh yeah, they grow naturally. They kill you too. So I think before we all just, you know, if we're even gonna be, well, I'm just saying, it's been brought up by three different people now, and if it's something that is gonna be considered, then I, we can vote on the resolution. That has nothing to do with that discussion. I, I know, I read the resolution. Okay, so that's not an issue. But I will say that before any kind of decision is made, mm -hmm. that we really then have to do just as much research on cork. And I make you a bet, there'll either be very little information, because it is so new, or we won't get anything definitive. And I think it always comes back to the same thing. Hindsight is 2020. Um, a lot of things that we know now, and a lot of things we're gonna know in the future, but I don't know if we're gonna have a definitive answer on cork any more than, than we will on this. That's it, that's all I wanna say. I, I'll take that challenge on, I think, no. I think we can get that. I wasn't and, challenging no, you. No, I'm just, I'm just saying, it's, <laughs> it's, 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 it's a lot different, and uh, I, I will agree with you that, like all things, it depends on where you get it sourced, just like, uh, um, you know, for, for infill. Well, as I right? said, though, the it's actual something that product, we have to there, find out. So the, 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 the proof that you're looking for depends on the vendor that you select, because if it does come from, say, a place like Portugal, which is the largest exporter well, of cork that gets used for, oh, by the way, wine bottles, um, but I would consider that be back, safe. We're back to but, that again, where you still have but, to, where does it come from? If there's always going to be a question. But I think we're all, I think we're all yeah. saying the same thing, that um, tonight we could vote on synthetic versus natural yes. and do a little more due diligence on yeah. infill. Okay. Okay. That sounds good. I'll add a, a brief point. If you, if you do some research on the turf, you know, some folks had brought up um, from the frequently asked questions and Q&As about what do you do with this now toxic substance in nine years when the time comes to dispose of it? There's enough used turf dealers out there that recycle your crumb rubber, they suck your crumb rubber out, should that be the infill, and they take it away and they source it where you could buy it again, and or they remove the, gra the, the turf, the grass portion, and they, and they sell it. And, they, and they, so technically, I guess, into that end, we could buy used you know, turf to that end. Yeah. And um, it, it would be a, a viable option to resource the turf in other areas of our district, the batting cages, for example, or pitcher's mounds start a little bit early so you're not tearing up the, the turf of the mound. Et cetera, et cetera. So you know, there's are there are other uses on the back end of this turf, and they buy the turf from you. They, so there's some you know augmented cost there. Now, granted, not as much. It's not it's not a one for one, but it is it is there is a recovery on the back end, and and it is disposable. It is it is people do take it away. So. Okay. Anyone? Anything else? Okay. 
Resolved, the board authorizes the synthetic turf field to be a part of the facility's improvement for athletics on the May 17th, 2022 pr proposition to be voted on at that time. I have a motion? So, so moved. And a second. Second. second? second. John, go ahead. Question, Nancy. So, so it sounds like we've kind of bifurcated this into the, the turf and the infill. No, no, it's just turf. It's turf or natural. That's well, what we're voting on. So, 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 so when I say bifurcate, so we've separated the two issues. So tonight we're just focusing on the turf issue. Which we had to do tonight. And, and we're going to spend some more time yep. on the infill issue. Absolutely. Is, is that my mm -hmm. understanding? Absolutely. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So I had a motion and a second. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions, motion carried, thank you. Okay, we move on to the budget presentation. Okay, so tonight, <clears throat> Tonight we're going to talk about the budget again. Uh, this is our second meeting and we will continue this discussion and we'll start to dig a little bit more into what the numbers mean, what our needs are, etc. So the first thing, I just want to highlight what we're going to be talking about. We're going to quickly talk about the goals and the process a little bit. We're going to dive into the expenditures, the revenue. We're also going to talk about fund balance and our reserves. So the first thing to point out is that one of our goals is always, always to keep the tax levy increase as low as possible, and above all, never go over the cap. Secondly, we always want to maintain our current staff levels and our programs. Uh, that which is successful, we do not want to impact. And the third bullet is we want to continue to support and grow our programs, both instructionally and operationally. We can never get complacent. There's always more that we can do. As far as the budget process itself, as I go through these, uh, the numbers, so to speak, it's important to keep in mind that these are rollover budget numbers. And again, what I mean by rollover is we are keeping the same program, same uh, both instruction and operational uh, programs in place. If something is not needed or does not exist in the next year, we will not have it in there. And lastly, we continue throughout this entire process to seek out additional funding and cost savings as we go through this. So with that said, the preliminary expenditures, and I say preliminary because there's still some open items. The preliminary budget is $81.1 million. The current year's budget is 76.6. .6. It's 4.5 million. We have some open items here. The first one is staff retirements. We should see the, the crux of whatever might come down the pipe by the end of this month. As we do every year, we have some special ed annual reviews that are still not completed. Those could change the dynamics a little bit. It's good to note, though, that the open items that we have this year are a bit less than we had in the past. You might recall one of the big ones was some of the BOCES coasters. We have all that information. On the other side of the coin, we have to pay for these expenditures. How do we do that? Well, we have revenue projections. And the revenue for next year comes in at 77.4 versus this year at 74.3. So we have an increase of about $3 million. What is that comprised of? Well, a couple points. First of all, our tax levy. Our tax levy that we are allowed to go up to. I'm not saying we're going there but the amount that we are allowed to go up to is 4.9% increase, which would be an increase of almost 2.5 million. I will tell you, though, that in the projection, our property tax levy includes a 0% increase. Okay, if we can achieve that, which I think we can, that will be the first time uh, in my tenure here that we've had that opportunity. The increase in state aid is 3.1 million, and there was a small decrease in miscellaneous revenue. Just a quick recap on the tax levy cap. 
It began several years ago, quite a few years ago, actually. It's not a true 2%, as I always keep talking about. If we wanted to go over the 4.9%, you would need a 60% majority vote. And lastly, if the budget went down twice, the board would have no choice but to go to a 0% contingency budget. So what does this all look like when you put it all together? You know, we have expenditures and we have to pay for them. So as I indicated, the budget, the, pre the preliminary budget is 81.1 million. The revenues, which are comprised of the property tax levy, our state aid, and our miscellaneous income, come to that 77.4 million in revenue. So that leaves us with a shortfall of 3.7. As we do every year, we have an assignment of fund balance. We are looking at an assigned amount of fund balance of 3.7 million. Now, if you remember, for the current year, the amount that we have assigned is $2,250,000, okay? So you might say, where are we getting that other million and a half, 1.5 million more to assign? Because of the federal funds, we have been able to supplant certain expenditures which have, will create a revenue source in terms of a surplus that we can apply to next year, okay? And that amount is about 1.55. So that is, you can think of that as a one-time opportunity that we're going to take advantage of. So by virtue of keeping our normal, regularly assigned fund balance the same, 2250000 and using that additional surplus this one time allows us to meet the expenditures without having a tax levy increase. Let's talk about fund balances. I've got the, the at, at the end of the last year, as well as the two previous, where we stand on all of our fund balances and our reserves. If you just focus on the bottom line right now, you'll see that currently we're at 13.6 million. That's up from the previous year, two, three million dollars. It's important to note though, that the, a large portion of this is that capital reserve. And the reason I point that out is because it seems to me that there's a lot of talk about we have a lot of money, okay? And it's real simple to see that, you know, if you take away this capital reserve, which we're going to be using, we're down to about eight. Now, again, people will say, and they have been saying, that's a lot of money. You have a lot of money. Well, it's a lot of money until something happens and you need it. Now, I want to also, I did some research just to bring to, to light here. And with regards to some neighboring school districts, Highland Falls, our budget, as you might see, uh, might have seen before, was $81 million that we're proposing. Highland Falls budget is $35 million. All their fund, balance, fund balances and capital reserves, $16 million. Okay? Port Jervis, $75 million budget, pretty comparable to us, always have been in terms of budget. Their total, 30 million. Washingtonville, their budget is 109 million, so it's about 50, about 45 percent more than us. Their capital reserves and fund balance, 26 million, twice as much as us. So, again, they've been planning it for a long time. They've had this opportunity. We continue to struggle, and we try to keep putting money into these reserves for that rainy day. So what comprises the $81 million budget that we're talking about here? Uh, there's 11 categories that you'll see up front here. It's got the preliminary or the rollover budget compared to the current year's approved budget. And if you look at the bottom, it comes to the 81 versus the 76.6 point this for this year. Let's look at each one of these. So the first one is salaries. Salaries for the, for the rollover is just short of $40 million. For the current year, it's just short of 38. So there's an increase of almost $2 million. This includes all compensation, contractual salaries, stipends, tutorials, coaches. You have it. If we pay this compensation, it is here. 
And those that are providing those services, our staff, are made up of six collective bargaining units as well as some individual contracts. So the six um, collective bargaining unit contracts are indicated down below. We have the teachers and the nurses. Their contract is expiration is to, uh, June 30th of 25. That is pending ratification from the union. Our paraprofessionals, their contract expires in 2023. The custodial and clerical expired last year. We are in negotiations with the, with the clerical and we are getting close to having the custodial and maintenance group be ready to meet with us. They have been spending some time putting together their information. We have the administrative unit, which expires in 2025, and we have the food service that expires in 2023. As well, there's a host of individual contracts. The next item is pension expenses. There's primarily three pensions that we pay into as an employer. The total cost for next year comes to almost 7.4 million. It's currently 7.1, so there's an increase of $274,000. What is that made up of? The three consists of the teacher's retirement system. That is for the instructional staff. Think of that more in terms of the teachers, the TAs, as well as administration. The rate for that is going up to 10.29% from 9.5, I'm sorry, 9.8. Doesn't seem like a lot, but again, compare it to the previous number, it, you know, it, it's a big number that it gets applied against. ERS, these are the non-instructional. This is the food service, this is the custodial, the maintenance. Their rate is coming down. Why is their rate coming down and TRS going up? Two different systems. TRS is, a, is based on a rolling five-year average, and it's heavily tied to the stock market. One of the things that they did last year, and it's still being factored in, is they lowered their expectations in terms of what the market is going to perform, even though the market has been doing well up until late. ERS, that's governed at the state level. We don't have a lot of insight on that. That's all based on the, you, um, the state controller oversees that. The good news is that it's coming down. And the third pension plan is Social Security. As everybody knows, that rate hasn't changed. It's 7.65%. So there's the history, if you, if you look at it, going back eight years. Uh, TRS, it's pretty much hovering in a range somewhere around, you know, between like eight, eight to 10, eight to 11. TRS has been come, it came down this year. If you look at the chart, it kind of shows that all roads are leading toward more of a, you know, 10 to 12 range. I think we're going to see that, uh, and, I, and I think, you know, even if it just stabilizes, it's a good thing. If, if it goes up a little bit, like it has this year, that's, that really imp impacts us and it hurts us. Health insurance. Health insurance is a very big cost. It took a bit of an increase this year. Um, for the preliminary budget, the rollover, it's 10.7 from 10.2. So it's about a half a million dollar increase. Why? What we're finding is that the utilization coming out of COVID is impacting all health plans. We have, for our employees, we offer two plans. We offer the Orange Ulster Health Plan, or we also offer the New York State Insurance Plan, NYSHIP. Two different plans. Similar, but yet distinct. The Orange Ulster Health Plan is consisting of 17 school districts and one BOCES. NYSHIP, on the other hand, represents the whole state in terms of 1.2 million uh, New York State public employees and their families. So let's talk about the OU Health Plan first. The health plan as a whole had a 7% increase, as a whole. But that is divvied up depending on the type of coverage you have. So single, it went up 5.85%, two family 1%, family 12%, and then Medicare was, was quite a range there. Why is there such a range? That is based on, the, the actuaries look at a couple things. One is utilization by each group. Additionally, they look at the claim ratio. And that's basically, think of it as a loss ratio, claim ratio, it has a couple different names, but it's essentially, what does that group pay in 
related to what is paid out for that group. And what's actually transpired is that the family plans, the family participants, we've been paying out, the plan has been paying out more than, say, the singles, okay? It's not unusual, you know, obviously a family of five, you're gonna have a greater payout than an individual. Nice ship. Nice ship's rates went up quite heavily. Singles 11.3, family 12.7. Their Medicare stayed pretty low. That's a 0.2% to a 0.7%, okay? What I can tell you is that the Orange Ulster Health Plan has cheaper rates for the active single Two family and family. I didn't mean, not two family. Two person, single, and family. But NYSHIP has lower rates with regards to the retiree Medicare. Okay? We do not have a lot of individuals that take the NYSHIP. We also have contractually, we, we are obligated to provide certain dental and vision benefits, and we use four different plans for that. If somebody decides to forego health insurance being provided by the district, there is a buyout provision where we actually pay them contractually. We pay them anywhere from $2,300 to $2,500 a year, and that's considered the health insurance buyout. It actually helps everybody. We don't have to pay out $25,000, and they get a little, little something. All these, all these um, premiums that we pay, we don't, we don't cover 100%. For the active, we collect from the employees or the employees contribute anywhere from 9% to 20% of the premium, depending on the unit, depending on the individual. Once you retire, the rate, depending on the circumstances, is anywhere from 0 to 50% for the retired employees. Just to indicate and, and show you the complexity of, of, of dealing with this, there's, there's a couple things that change this and make health insurance dynamic all year long. The rates and the premiums that we pay, I'm sorry, not the rates, but the premiums that we pay can change from month to month. Why? In November, there's something called open enrollment. That gives you the opportunity to change the plan you're on, either say from family to single or vice versa, or you can go from NYSHIP to the OU Health Plan. There's also qualifying events that happen all year long. People have children, people get married, et cetera. They can change their plan at that point in time. Mid-year retirements. Again, somebody decides to retire. It's not a savings per se because they're going from active <clears throat> to retiree. We also have to pick up the new employee who's backfilling that position. So you're essentially going from paying two premiums I'm sorry, one premium to two premiums. So there's a lot going on there. The next area we're gonna talk about is the contractual supplies and equipment. This is kind of a little bit of a catch-all. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of little stuff here. Um, it's 7.5 million for the projected, for up from 7 million. It includes, as examples, the following items here. The BOCES COSER agreements, this is non-special ed. There's a lot that we do with BOCES, and we do it for good reason. We get aid on it. Professional services, equipment, hardware, software. There's a lot of instructional software that's used every day in the classrooms. We have maintenance and service contracts that Walter uses, repairs and maintenance, rubbish removal, textbooks, supplies, both in the classroom as well as the custodial and the maintenance supplies. That number is up a little bit higher than normal, and it's largely attributable to what's going on right now. The, the cost of, of procuring things is, is going through the roof, and we don't see really any signs of that changing. Uh, Walter's supplies, just the paper goods, dramatic, okay? Um, the last area we're gonna talk about tonight is out-of-district tuition. This is tuition that we pay for those special needs students that go to an educational facility, educational program out of district. It's actually going down in terms of the cost. 
So for next year, we project three, almost 3.8 million down from four. So where are these children going? What is, what is causing this decrease? Well, the first placement is BOCES. We have 28 students attending five different BOCES. What's important to note is that this number, this 28, is the same as it is this year. Okay, so there's no real change with respect to that. We also have out-of-day out programs that are non-BOCES. There's 17 students attending nine different programs in five different counties. Nine, the 17 students is the same as what we have this year. This is, well, this is kind of coincidental. It's just, it, stability is good, so I'm, I'm kind of happy with that. And then lastly, we have out-of-district residential programs. These are programs that the students actually stay there. And in addition to, to tuition that we pay, we also have to pay room and board, okay? We have two students going to two locations. This is where we had a change. We had four students, we have four students currently. We'll only have two next year. So the savings comes largely from this area. The other, you know, the other amounts are just small tweaks. They could be the related services that they get. Maybe one, maybe this year they're getting three sessions of OT a week and maybe next year they're only getting one. Those are just little tweaks. So with that said, we will cover the balance of the expenditures and we'll be diving into revenue a little bit more detailed next time we meet. We have three more sessions, the third of which the board must adopt the, the, uh, the budget. And at this point, I'll open up for any questions. Oh, good. Um, the increases in things like the TRS, I saw it in the NISMA uh, newspaper. Yep. Who, does the state determine that? I know we don't. When, when we're told to increase from 9.8 to 10.29 this year. That comes from where? Sure. So we have zero control over that. TRS is a separate entity. They determine that rate. They have their own board. They have their own actuaries. They calculate that. They have a methodology that they stick with. ERS is the state. It's the Office of the State Controller. He oversees that plan. He works in terms of the actu with the actuaries and so forth. Social Security is the government. Thank you. Harvey, uh, that, those stats that you listed, neighboring districts, capital reserve uh, figures, I trust that this is all handy, that you can copy and paste in an email, perhaps that you can send to me <laughs> for future use. Easily done. Okay, thank you. And it's all public information. It's just I would never ask you to do anything wrong, Harvey. <laughs> Hey, Harvey, um, yes. getting back to the, the notion of, of, of the budget and the vote. Yes. Um, you have a bullet that says, a twice defeated budget must adopt a tax levy no greater than the current year's tax levy. Right. But we're not planning to increase the tax levy. Yes, correct. So if the voter, I, I hate to speculate, but if the voters vote no. Twice. Twice. Where's what that? happens? We're in, a, we're in a good place. Nothing happens, right? Nothing happens. Nothing we, changes. We go, we go forward with the plan. Right. Right? Thank you. Right. Anything else? All right. Just hey, a, a yeah. process note. So next week is we'll, so viewers at home, should they be watching, next week we'll talk more about um, expenditures, as you said. We'll finish out the expenditures. Yeah. Um, as you might have, this, we only talked about half of these. We're going to dig into the balance next week. In the two weeks, I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. You'll have a special session for you. All right, thank you. Thanks, Harvey. Okay, so we're up to um, <coughs> our second opportunity for public comments. Any wish, anyone wishing to speak, you need to use a microphone. We would ask you to... State your name, please, and we would ask you to limit your comments to three to five minutes at this time. Thank you.
Testing? <clears throat> okay, everybody can hear me, yep. right? I apologize, I should have been here at the last meeting. And let me tell you, I tried, but the place where I was, it was important for them, for me to be there and finish what I was doing. Now, I respect everybody's opinion and the way you voted. That's America, right? But there is a couple items <clears throat> that I need to, to correct. Natural grass is getting a bad rap. And everybody's saying how bad it is, right? Has, has anybody heard a place by the name of Rush Harrietta? That's near Buffalo. In 2015, they had a choice, like all of us do, to vote for an artificial turf or for a natural grass field. They place the safety of their students ahead of anything else, and they voted to put in Kentucky blue grass, just what Mr. McNick, McNitt and said in his presentation. Three years later, the field is perfect. I tried to get a hold of them this morning in it, but unfortunately, I wasn't able to do so. So natural grass, if properly installed with a rapid drain system, at the end of a heavy rain, is bone dry. With proper mood out fields, because it was low budgeted when we, put, we finished the high school. And there is multiple reasons why that was low budgeted. No sense opening that Pandora box. They have, though, two fields. And for us to have what everybody's complaining about it, that we're putting the one field to the high school. It deprives the community. And there was different reason why the high school was placed in there. I'm not going to go into that. The second item that should be corrected is, and no one spoke about it, is the PF PFAS. It's not in the crumb field. That is in the turf itself, in the polypropylene and the polyethylene which is the, the grass blades. And I don't know if anyone knew this, but President Biden, in December, December 21st, working with, with the PA, EPA, are labeling PFAS hazardous material. Now, one thing that you need to answer, and that was one of the questions that I gave you in my list, what are you going to do? How are you going to clean the storm water coming in through the polypropylene? If the EPA completes their, their work and that's a hazardous material, this becomes contaminated water. You cannot just dump it into the environment. I did a little research. How do you clean it right now? There's no approved way of doing it. It's forever chemical. To clean regular storm water that's contaminated with different material, it costs between $80 and $150 per ton, one ton. One ton is the size of a washing machine. There are 200 in 24 gallons per ton. An artificial field will have 8,000 gallons of storm water that you have to clean up. 8,000 for one inch of water. In Orange County, during average reason, you have 45 inches of water. What are you going to do with it? Harvey, do the numbers. And the low ball is $3,500 every time it rains, one inch of water. Multiply times 45, you're talking about close to a quarter million dollars a year. All right, that's the economical impact. 
It's on the books. There is three senators. Senator, well, our senator, um, not Schumer. What's the other one? The young lady. No, oh, she, Warren, and the Connecticut senator. They all are pushing for hearing to look into the artificial turf and the consequences. Of course, this now has become very big. No one answer or no one has a single report that the artificial turkey is safe. No one. The answer, the Washington um, report, that was done, that was not done as a risk uh, study. It was done only there is so much population, there are so many people that are getting cancer. The other item that um, Mr. McNett said that proved that that was uh, artificial turf, turf is safe, that was done in 2016 by the Connecticut Department of Health. Well, 2000, 2010, I take it back. In 2016, they revised that. They can no longer say the artificial turf is safe. Give me one study, one that says that it is safe. It doesn't exist. Mount Sinai, we will answer them. They say they will not because they're the one that treat the children. Children, environmental, school, or, med or medicine, Mount Sinai. What do you say to them? They don't know what they're doing. Next. I must try to wrap it up. I understand, but you guys, I listen to you guys for the whole night, so give me a break. A Anthony? Yes. I, I would ask you to start to wrap it up, please. Yes. Thank you. I heard you. Thank you. I heard you. Uh, we talked about the injuries on the, on the field. 16% I read the study. And what you said is right. However, there is another study from the British Federal, and he is the president of the National Football League Player Association. And he's asking them the whole, um, what do you call the whole, uh, the owners to change all the fields to grass because too many players are getting injured. According to their numbers, at, at least in Division One, 199% higher PLC injury and artificial grass and artificial turf versus natural grass. At least in Division Two and Three, competitions experience 213% higher PLC injuries and artificial turf than natural grass. There's their livelihood. So if they get hurt very badly, they're done. It's a lifetime changing event for them. Remember what Dr. McNett said. He's a proposal of natural grass. But artificial grass has got its place. I agree. People, grown up people, they're all, they, the organs are well set. Children are developing yet. And so everything in life, I agree, it's got a risk. But what percentages? Some of the data, they're saying a 56% higher rate of injury for children on um, artificial grass versus natural grass. But if you get a chance, Google that, uh, that town. Rush Henrietta, at outside of East, East Rochester in Buffalo. I, I picked that up because it, it's very cold there. So if it survives there, for us, it should be a lot easier. 
Thank you for listening, and thank you for your work. Thank you, Anthony. <clears throat> Still on? Okay. <laughs> I promise it won't be that long. Um, if you don't know, my, my name's Tom Keen. If people in the world don't know, I was one of the biggest supporters of the last two bonds. I had a huge sign in my yard. Um, and I was devastated when I got voted down. And I don't want to see any part of this bond get voted down. I really, really don't. Um, but I came to the conclusion that the reason why it got voted down last time was there was a lack of communication and a lack of trust. And I feel we're repeating it. Um, the fact that we even standing here were worried about it, maybe we need to take a step back and realize maybe we're not doing a good enough job of communicating. Oh, okay. I didn't hear the echo. Um, I don't think there's, there's such a, you know, the problem with the trust is a lack of information. I haven't seen a detailed item by item line of this project yet. So nobody else has seen it. I have about three questions on my sheet that haven't been answered. So I know other people have questions that haven't been answered. And if you don't answer people's questions, they come up with their own answers. And that's how we get misinformation. Don't do that. You know, we're about to present a request for a new capital reserve fund. I haven't seen this five-year plan. Everyone talks about it. So I'm sure you're all nice people, and I all know you personally. You're all very nice people. But you're asking people to just trust you without showing them the plan. You need to show people the plan. OK? Uh, if you have plans to fix up the middle school, that's great. People would love to hear that. But they haven't seen it. There's no proof that you're going to do it. You're asking them to just trust you. You need to do a better job of putting things in black and white and showing people what your plan is. That would alleviate all that mistrust. I really, really don't want to see this, any part of this bond go down. Please don't let it fail. Please do a better job. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Anyone else? OK, I'd like a motion to adjourn. So moved. And second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you.